All right, finally able to get outside and do a sermon. It's been a long time, a uh, long winter, and, and uh, it's been raining a lot lately and everything else, so a lot of things going on. But uh, just haven't been able to get out here. But uh, we're finally out, out here in God's creation. And uh, we're going to talk today about the eyes, your two eyes. And a very interesting study. The Lord really showed me some interesting things while doing this study. It's kind of in, uh, a neat thing when you actually go into a Bible study sometimes, you'll have a preconceived notion of what you think the Bible is going to teach about a subject. And as you look up the scriptures, all of a sudden you realize, oh, actually, no, it's teaching something else. That's what happened to me when I was doing this study. So we're going to talk about the subject of eyes, like I said, and specifically so devil possession and the fact that it will show up in the eyeballs of somebody when they are possessed with devils. You'll get a weird feeling. you say, boy, that guy's eyes bother me. There's just something there with the eyes. I'm going to show you why that is in this study. Now, what's the very first mention of the word eyes in the Bible? The very first time it appears. You can turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, the good old law of first mention. Whenever you see a word in the Bible, a lot of times it will be defined or the how it's used a lot through the Bible will kind of appear there the very first time it shows up. So Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start here at verse 1. You're very familiar with this, I'm sure, if you're a Bible-believing Christian. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, here we go, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and the fruit thereof, and did eat, and also gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now look at verse 7. Satan said, your eyes are going to be open. Did it happen? Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So Satan told them the truth. Their eyes were opened. Was it a good thing? No, it wasn't. When their eyes were opened, they actually all of a sudden realized, whoa, the reality of sin and wickedness, which they had not known before. Very interesting. And there's something else that's very interesting, too. What does it say in verse 1? The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. What is a characteristic of a serpent with their eyes? Did you know that there is no such thing as a snake that has eyelids? Every snake that you ever see in, in the world, here's a picture or two, I'll put up some pictures. Every snake that you see out there, they have no eyelids. Their eyes are constantly open. They never go shut. They're wide open. They don't even look like I'm looking right now. You know, you can see here I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm, you know, if I go like this, you know, and I have my eyes open, you know, like, like that, really, I mean, that's the way it would be. They can't even kind of close them a little bit or whatever. So, very interesting, a characteristic of a snake there is that they have, their eyes are open, wide open. Hmm. You say, well, then Satan would be the only one then that would say about this thing of your eyes being opened. And so, you know, you hear people and they say, boy, it really opened my eyes. And I thought, maybe that has a satanic origin. That's what I thought originally. But then I did this, this study and it was like, no, actually, we're going to see if there's actually somebody else that talks about having your eyes open. Somebody else that can open and close eyes, spiritually speaking. Turn next to Galat or, Galatians. Yeah. Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, we're going to see the, the next reference to somebody's eyes being opened. We're actually going to look at all the references today because they're very, they're very, very interesting, tell a very unique story. Genesis chapter 21, verse 12 through 21. It says here, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. 
In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child and sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him, a good way off, as it, was, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, and lifted up her voice, and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now look at this, verse 19. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad to drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. So, there was a well of water there, but she didn't see it until... God opened her eyes. Hmm. So, you'll see this thing all throughout the Bible. This, this common theme through the Bible is when God does something, Satan will always counterfeit it. God has the, that ability to open people's eyes, open and blind them as well. We're going to see that in this study. God has that ability, and so Satan tries to counterfeit that. That's why he came to Eve and he said, I can... If you, if you do this thing here, your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to see these spiritual truths that nobody else knows and stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he still uses that trap today too, by the way. But you see there, God can open the eyes too. Next we're going to go to Numbers chapter 22. And I can't cover all these stories in great detail. You can read these on your own sometime. But uh, here we have the story of this man named Balaam. And he's riding upon an ass the Bible word for donkey, and um, he's riding, and God tries to stop him by sending an angel down, and the, and the ass is turning and, and moving, and she's, she's, you know, trying to get away from this angel, and Balaam's getting mad, and he's, he's hitting the, the ass and everything until she finally starts to speak to him, and it's interesting because if you read the New Testament, it actually says that she spake with man's voice. Hmm. Thought that was kind of interesting. But Numbers chapter 22, verse 31. Let's look here. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. <laughs> okay? Very interesting there. Because the donkey, the ass, she saw the angel. She was one of God's creatures. God had no reason really to hide this angel from her. But Balaam, just as a regular man, he couldn't see that spiritual realm. He could not see that angel standing right there in the way. You know, he couldn't see him. And the ass is going, whoa, okay, there's a big angel here, and he's got a sword. You know, I want to turn out of the way of this. And, and Balaam's going, you stupid thing, you know, go that way. And it wasn't until God opened up his eyes, and then when he saw the reality of that angel standing there, he went, okay, whoa, and fell down on his face. But again, you see, that spiritual realm was veiled. He couldn't see it with his normal eyesight. It was not until God opened his eyes and now he could see and he went, whoa. I mean, there could be an angel standing right here. I have no idea. I can't feel anything. I can't touch anything, whatever. I can't see anything. You can't see anything. But if God said like that and took away the veil from the physical realm to the spiritual realm, You'd see what's standing around me. God has that ability, in other words. Next, we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. A little bit windy today, so I have a little bit of help turning my pages for me. Doesn't always work, though, all that well. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 through 18. It says here, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? They were being, these, these Syrians were actually coming after Elisha, and there was a huge army of them out there. 
and, and Elisha's servant's going, oh, you know, he goes out in the morning to, to, you know, do whatever chores he had to do or whatever, and he goes out and he sees this gigantic army. Look at verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And um, remember that too, Christian, for you today, before I go on here. Remember that God has powerful armies of angels that can protect you. And, you know, I realize that sometimes Christians get martyred, and I realize that sometimes bad things do happen to Christians. But uh, keep in mind that we are part of Christ's body. And if God wants you protected, there's not a force in this world that can overthrow his mighty angels. Remember that. Remember to have your fear in the right area, in other words. But uh, verse 18, And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So this army that had been there, that had come to attack Elisha, they couldn't see this huge army of angels. And in fact, Elisha prayed and said, smite them with blindness. And so they're actually blinded. They can't even see. Interesting too, because that's what happened back in Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels smote the, the Sodomites, the perverts out there. They smote them with blindness. Hmm. And they wearied themselves trying to find the door to try and get in there and rape these two men. Try and sodomize them two angels. You know, that's a real smart thing to do, you know. But uh, when you're a pervert, you don't really think too much with your head, with your brain. But let's look here at verse 19. Uh, and Elijah said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. In other words, he goes out to this army, and he says, Hey, this isn't the city, and I, I'll, I'll take you to where this man is. And, the, and these, you know, Syrian army is like, oh, thank you, that's great, that's nice. <laughs> it was Elisha that they were after. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Huh. Very interesting. Now, you know, it says there that they were blinded, but, you know, it almost looks like from the text that they were, we weren't totally blind like they had to be led by the hand. It could be that they just were like, oh, you know, we don't recognize who this man is. And we don't really know where we're at right now. I Kind of just everything looks unfamiliar. And Elisha just leads them over to the city of Samaria, Samaria and says, okay, Lord, open their eyes again. And they open their eyes and they're like, what are we doing in Samaria? You know, interesting story. But you can see there again how God closes and opens people's eyes. Isaiah chapter 35. Here's the next reference. Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 verse 3 through 5. It says here, Strength, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Okay? You say, what's this a reference to? We'll look down at uh, verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And again, I can't read the whole chapter there for sake of time. But the thing is, you read this chapter, it's talking about the millennial kingdom. Interesting because when Jesus Christ was on the earth, every time he was around men that were blind, he was restoring their sight. Hmm. So in the millennial kingdom, there won't be any blind people. Everybody's going to see. Isn't that something? See, God can control that. God can heal people that are blind. And right now, you know, if there's somebody out there that's blind, you know, God might have a purpose for them being blind. You know, God might have some kind of a reason. I mean, you know, I don't really know what it would be, but, you know, God has reasons. You know, and, and so 
he can't he isn't going to heal people the same way you know and right now as he did back when he was here on the earth and as as he will in the future but he definitely will be doing that in the millennial kingdom again another very interesting story now let's go to the new testament matthew chapter 9 verse 27 Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, 27. Check my reference here again. Matthew 9, 27 through 31. And remember, here in context, when Jesus Christ came in the book of Matthew, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the physical millennial kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from. Okay, so kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are two separate things. You have to get that distinction in the Bible. The book of Matthew is specifically pointed to Jews and the fact that their king was there, he was offering the kingdom, they rejected their king, so the kingdom is put off for a while. All right, so it's very important to understand that. So what we read back there in Isaiah chapter 35 about the blind being healed and everything and the, and the deaf and the dumb and all this other stuff you know being healed those things are now being offered by jesus christ because he's there he's the king he's saying you accept me as your messiah the kingdom can come in so let's read here matthew chapter 9 verse 27 through 31 and when jesus departed thence two blind men followed him crying and saying thou son of david have mercy on us. Interesting, because in the millennial kingdom, Jesus sits on the throne of David. Hmm. Verse 28, And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So you see him healing the blind there. Why? The king's present. But that's important. Go next to Matthew chapter 20, verse 30. Matthew chapter 20, verse 30. And behold, two men, two blind men, sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Immediately. Not uh, like the modern charismaniac faith fakers. You know, they're not healers, they're fakers that say, you know, if you come up and give a big enough seed offering and love offering and all this other stuff, you know, you might receive your sight or, you know, yeah. Or they, they hire actors to come up and pretend that they're blind, you know. But uh, you aren't going to get one that actually can restore the sight to a blind man just by laying their hands on their eyes. Not going to happen. And it's not because people don't have enough faith either. It's because it's not here for today. Luke chapter 24, we'll go there next, Luke 24, Luke 24 verse 13 through 32, read a bunch of verses here, and behold two of them went the same, that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score uh, furlongs, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus drew near and went with them. Now look at this, verse 16. But their eyes were holden that they should not see, or should, that they should not know him. Excuse me. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleophas, or Cleopas, excuse me, answering, said unto him. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? You gotta love how the Lord does it. 
And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre, and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Did they have faith in Jesus rising from the dead? No, they didn't. They were doubting it. They were saying, you know, I thought it was supposed to come true. I thought he was the Messiah, but it just doesn't look like it. I don't think it worked out. I just, you know, he just seemed like a, the right guy, but that's what they're thinking. Their eyes were blinded. I mean, they're standing there talking to Jesus, and yet they didn't even recognize him. Kind of like a lot of the modern Christians today, they say that they know Jesus and they love Jesus and everything else. I hate to tell you, but Jesus could be standing right beside them. They wouldn't know him. They wouldn't know him for one second. But let's continue here. Let's look at Jesus' loving response to them. Then he said unto them, verse 25, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You know, just like Peter. Peter was like, be it far from thee, Lord. You, 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 no, you don't have to die on the cross. You don't know. No, no, no. We'll think of something else, another option. And Jesus is saying, it's written. The prophets prophesied that this stuff is going to happen. Why are you doubting? Why are you saying, oh, no, no, I, I don't really know if it was supposed to happen this way. The Bible said about it. And, and let me just say this again before I continue. This debunks this stupid, ridiculous teaching that they were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. That's ridiculous. After the cross had happened, they still didn't understand salvation. All right? They were not saved by looking forward to the cross. Don't, don't fall for that lie. That is a ridiculous lie. Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the, the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. Look at verse 31. And their eyes were opened. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Huh. You mean having your eyes opened and the scriptures being opened to you have a thing in common? Uh-huh. You know why a lot of people, I mean, you know, if you're a Bible believer, right now it just seems like it's almost an insult to the intelligence of any Bible believer out there, just like people go, I don't believe the Bible. Huh? Everything that the Bible prophesied about the last days is coming to pass right now. You know, and I just, sometimes you just look at the news and you think, it's, it's almost so obvious, you think, how on earth could anybody not believe the Bible? I mean, all this came about by chance? This is all just, you know, uh, you know, an explosion billions of years ago made it all happen? Huh? People are crazy. They're crazy. Or they're blind. They're spiritually blinded. Why? Well, because they're non-elect. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I don't believe in Calvinism. They're blinded because they don't want the truth. They have doubts. Why were those disciples there? Why were they, their eyes holding? Why were they not able to see Jesus Christ? You know, they're, they're saying, we don't really know if he was the right one. And it's him there standing right there talking to them. I don't really know if Jesus was the right one or not. I don't, I don't really know for sure. And there he is. They're doubting the resurrection and they're the guy that just got resurrected. Why? Why? Because they didn't want to see. They were doubting. They were second guessing the Word of God, the prophets, what the prophets had spoken. Hmm. You see, every atheist out there, they have a reason why they're atheists. 
it isn't just simply because, I mean, you know, you might have somebody in a communist country that's never heard of the Bible or whatever else. But even there, you know, even there, they should still have the law of God. They still have the law of God written in their heart. They still can look at this and say, all this happened by chance? Something doesn't seem right there. I don't know what, something doesn't seem right. See, I don't fall for the thing that atheists just, well, they don't know. They've never really heard the right thing. Every atheist I've ever run into has an attitude about the rules of Scripture. They call God homophobic, or they say He's judgmental, or He killed people, and whatever else. They can't stand what's written in the book. That's why they reject it. Every single one I've ever met. They are blinded because they doubt, and they don't want to see it. So God just says, fine. You don't want to see it? Just look at the world and think things are getting better. Look at the world, think, think that everything happened by chance. Convince yourself of this. Be blind. But let's look at verse 45 here. See it again here. It says, Jesus comes back to them and, he, and it says, Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Okay. If Jesus Christ doesn't open the scriptures to you, all the seminary, all the teaching, all the indoctrination at the university means nothing. Not a thing. Jesus Christ has to open up your understanding or you're not going to understand this book. Just the way it is. Next go to John chapter 9. Now this one has some very interesting things in it, so we're actually going to read the whole chapter. Not going to be a real in-depth expository thing here, but, you know, <clears throat> there's just so many verses, so much important doctrine being taught here. Um, and it's, it's in type. It's talking about somebody who's lost and somebody who, is, who gets saved. Their eyes are open. They get saved. We're going to see that as we continue. John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Question. Are we born in sin? Yep. You're a sinner from your birth. Now, you're not held accountable until you reach that age where you understand, okay, I have sinned against God here. Now you're accountable. But all of us are born sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went uh, his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which, were, which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Verse 9, Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Very interesting there. We'll stop there for just a minute. Very interesting because it gives a perfect example of a born again, saved sinner. There's a change. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's a change. And you get some guy and, he, and he's like, you know, I mean, here's, here's the picture. I'll put it up again. David Spurgeon, before and after, second in command of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang, saved, Bible-believing preacher. They don't look the same. And it's funny because you get he'd go to some place where a lot of the outlaws are and stuff like that. They'd say, was that Dave Spurgeon? And someone would be going, uh, I think so. It looks like him. But is it? Is it him? And, and Dave Spurgeon had to say, yeah, it's me. It's Dave Spurgeon. See? Why? He was blind in the life of sin before, and God washed him. Now he's clean, and he's a new creature. Now he can see, and the people that are still blind, they're going, is that really him? I don't, I don't know if that's him. I, he looks so different. There must be a change when you get saved. And you say, oh, then you're teaching work. I'm saying, 
God changes you. If I was teaching that it's all on you and you just do all the changing yourself and everything else, that is works, yes. But God will change you when His Holy Spirit moves into your life. There will be changes because He owns you now. You gotta get a hold of that thing. But let's continue here. Verse 10, Therefore say they unto him, How are thine eyes opened? Just like people will say to a saved person, What changed your life? Verse 11, He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. See, Jesus put the clay on his eyes when he was still blind. He said, Go wash, and he opened up his eyes. Jesus was someplace else. Okay? Very interesting, too, there, because it's also another similarity between, you know, him, the blind man, and us today. You say, you know, I got saved. Jesus saved me. He washed me in his blood. I, my sins are washed away. I'm a new creature. And they say, show me Jesus. Where is he? Well, I don't know where he is. I mean, he's in heaven right now. I know that, but uh, I can't show you Jesus. I don't know what he looked like. I have no idea. See? My eyes have been opened now to the reality of the world around me. But I don't know what Jesus looks like. I have to believe by faith. Hmm. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees him that before time was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Uh-oh. You know. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Oh no, division. Isn't that just awful? Uh, no, not when it's over truth. Truth will always divide. Jesus Christ is truth. Jesus Christ divides. Simple, works out real nice. Verse 17, they say unto the blind man again, What seest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? See, again, they'll do that. They'll see some Christian that's really on fire for the Lord, and they'll say, Taha, you know, you weren't a former motorcyclist, gang member in prison. You were not. I don't believe that. You know. See, it's the same thing. You you didn't used to do those things. I don't believe that. You know, I, I can tell you I was never in a motorcycle gang, but I was quite wild in my youth. And, and I had a motorcycle and I had long hair. And, you know, I'll tell you this. It was in my testimony. I'm going to be redoing it sometime soon here. But... I did 175 miles an hour on the street. I was constantly acting crazy and wild. It's a miracle I'm even alive. Some of the stuff I, stupid stuff I did. I mean, I, going well over 100 miles an hour over the posted speed limits, and I mean, I, I was quite insane. And people look at me and they go, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, you're a preacher and you want me to believe that you used to be, uh-huh, yeah, sure, uh-huh. See, same thing that's going on here. Why do people say that? Because there's such a change. There's such an amazing change in me. There's such an amazing turnaround in my life. I went from being very, very wild in my youth to now being a very calm guy, very nice, and I don't speed and, and act like a maniac, you know, when I'm on the road. There's a change. Verse 20, his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. Do you have relatives that uh, are kind of ashamed of your newfound faith? That say that you're in a cult? How many of you can relate to that? Verse 22, and why do they say that? Here we go again. Verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. They didn't want to be put out of their little religious group that they were in, their little social club. 
oh, well, that's, yes, that's our son, but, you know, we don't agree with him, and, and just, you know, you just talk to him about it. We don't, you know, we're kind of disconnected from it. Uh-huh. Verse 24, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25, He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Can you give an amen to that if you are truly saved? <laughs> I certainly can. Okay, very, very true. I was blind in my lost life. Extremely blind. I had no direction at all. I had no, why was I racing and going fast? And I had no reason to live. I had nothing in the future to live for. It was just one cheap thrill to the next. It would just act like a maniac and get an adrenaline rush. And, and you know, if I survive, I'll try uh, go, to go faster next time. What's the point? It's blindness. I had no reason, you know, to, to even live. It's ridiculous. Verse 26. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? I like that. Verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. You know, you're one of those Bible-believing King James only caught this. But I'm a Catholic. I'm a member of the one true church. <laughs> yeah. I'm a member in good standing of the First Baptist Church. You know, I'm a Methodist. Whatever. <laughs> Verse 29, we know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. In other words, you're calling Jesus a sinner. How did he open my eyes if he's a sinner? He prayed to God that my eyes are open, my eyes are open. If Jesus is this wicked, rotten guy, how did my eyes get opened? Verse 32, Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Precisely the reaction of modern day religious people. Who are you to judge me? Who? Who do you think you are? Don't you realize who you're talking to? I'm the Archbishop. I'm the Most Reverend. I'm a PhD. I'm a THD. Who are you to tell me? I mean, I have a church that has 6,000 members in it. We have the biggest bus ministry in town and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, uh-huh. See how it works? Not much changes, does it? Verse 35. Jesus heard that, he, that they had cast him out and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. Get a hold of that one. Those people that see not, the ones that are blind like I was in my lost life, I wanted to see. I wanted to understand what the world was about. There was just like, I just don't get it. I don't understand what this, what is life about? I, I just, I was discontent with the world. Why was I acting like a maniac? The world really had no thrill for me other than just a bunch of cheap vehicles and going fast and whatever else and acting like an idiot, you know, but I wanted the truth. See, I wasn't saying, hey, I'm content with the world and I think things are great and wonderful. And I was just like, what's the point? See, I didn't see what was really going on, but God gave me sight. He opened my eyes. But those people that think that they see what's going on, that they think that this world is all there is and this was all just evolution and we're just going to, you know, evolve into the next level or, you know, stronger survive and all this other stuff, they're blinded. Hmm. Verse 40, And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. 
See, they were saying, are you trying to say we're blind? You know, and meaning that we don't understand what's going on. And Jesus kind of spins it around and says, if you were blind, as in really blind, really not understanding what this world is and really wanting truth, then you would have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I mean, these are the same people that are calling Jesus a liar and a faker and all this other stuff. I mean, he just restored the, the, the eyesight to a man who was born blind. And they don't, you know, I don't believe he's God. You know, what are you, crazy or something? See, and they're saying, we, you know, we see who you are. I mean, I mean, think about it from their standpoint for a minute. Here you have this guy, he's a homeless man, a Jew, just like the Pharisees were, but he's homeless, and he's a carpenter, you know, because that's what they called him. You know, he's not only Joseph's son, the carpenter's son, but also he was a carpenter himself. And he's homeless, a carpenter, no education, you know, by man's standards. He doesn't have fancy titles or whatever else. Who is this guy? And this guy's trying to walk around and say he's God. You know, see, they looked on the outward appearance. They weren't looking at the works that he was doing. So the fact that they were judging everything by their sight and not really wanting truth, God said, or the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, said, you're blind. Truly blind. Hmm. What about the next man? Who's the next man that God opens his eyes? This is very interesting. Remember the Pharisees there. Acts chapter 9. Go to Acts chapter 9. In your King James Bible, if you're trying to follow along with you a new version, anything other than the King James Bible, you're not going to do too good watching these studies. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 22. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone, or shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed, journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, uh, or, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So you see again there, he's blinded. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he so, said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And, he, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed, and said, is not, is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? 
But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So, again, you see the perfect example of a lost man being blind, and the Lord restores his sight, and now he can see. And the change, the drastic change that that made in his life, people are going, what? Saul? Are you kidding me? Saul? He, I mean, he was going out killing these people, and now he's one of them? Huh? Again, a changed life follows true conversion. Do not fall for these liars, these wicked apostates that are trying to change that and say, there doesn't have to be a change after salvation. Watch out for that. Next, go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Oops. Romans 11, verse 7. We're going to read down through verse 12. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, the Jews, to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? God's not done with the nation of Israel yet. Not even close. And it doesn't. when it says about the nation of Israel there, it doesn't mean saved Christians living in America or some foolish nonsense. It is the Jewish nation of Israel located in Israel. You know, I know that's really tough for some people to understand, you know. They try to spiritualize Israel. Israel is North America and Canada, you know. <laughs> well, maybe if you're crazy. No, it's uh, Israel with Jerusalem as the headquarters there, the capital. But you see that thing there of right now these Jews are blinded. Their eyes are darkened. See, they rejected Jesus Christ back there in the first century. They can still get saved. You know, individual Jews can still get saved. But nationally, because they rejected Jesus Christ, their eyes are blinded. And it's so sad. I mean, you get these Jews and they're just like, you know, I've seen some, some really good videos by Jews. You know, this uh, one I referred to, Rabbi Mordecai Kraft. He had a great video on the thing of the Hebrew alphabet, the alephbet. They kind of say about that, you know. The alphabet... The Hebrew language is the original language, and you can actually find traces of all other languages coming from Hebrew. Very interesting, because what happened at the Tower of Babel there, when God confounded their language, it doesn't say that he created new languages. He confounded their language. So all other languages in the world are jumbled Hebrew, mixed up Hebrew. Very interesting. But it just is very saddening to watch a Orthodox Jew today rejecting Jesus Christ. And it's just like, he fulfilled the prophecies. I mean, it's just, he's proven to be the Messiah for the Jewish people. Why can't you see it? Why? Because their eyes are blinded. That's why. Hmm. Hmm. Next we're, next, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 4. show you another interesting thing here about sight. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Sorry, my pages are blowing all over the place here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God, King James Bible, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now look at this. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, 
but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now that's a thought, isn't it? According to that scripture right there, this book can see the Word of God, the written Word of God. That's what it's talking about. It's lowercase w. It's not talking about capital W, Jesus Christ. It's talking about the written Word. The written Word of God can see. Hmm. And isn't it interesting that when you have the Scriptures opened, your eyes are also opened. So now you can, you can look at the world through the lens of Scripture and you can say, ah, okay, I see what's going on. You look and you see some event happening, some earthquake happening, and all these wild earthquakes and stuff and all this weird weather and all this other stuff and upheavals and governments rising up and all that. And you say, man, what in the world's going on? Look through the pages of Scripture. Oh, okay. Oh, all right, I see what's going on. You see how that works? People that have their eyes closed and want them closed are ignorant of this book and they don't want the book. Get that book away from me. That's hate literature. It's whatever. But the people that truly want to understand what's going on in the world, you open the scriptures, it opens their eyes. Hmm. Interesting. And again, we're going to see in a little bit here how Satan counterfeits this. And he says, I can open your eyes without you opening the book. And he does that, by the way. And that's why you have all these weird new agers and stuff like this. They can understand what's going on. They can see, hey, things are really getting bad. They're not deceived like the masses of people that are just like, everything's getting wonderful and better, you know. And you have these weird new agers that are like, you know, you'll see them and they'll be like, you know, Oh, the earth, you know, Mother Earth is, is, is crying out in pain and, and we have to do something serious and the human species is in danger, you know. See, they can see a little bit of it because Satan has opened their eyes, but they aren't seeing through the lens of Scripture. So you have a lot of people in the uh, truth movement, you know, they're truthers and they're on their way to hell. Why? God didn't open their eyes. If they get to a point, you know, there are people that get into the truth thing and they eventually are led to Jesus Christ and salvation, that's fine. But when you have people that reject Jesus Christ and yet know the truth about the New World Order and all the other stuff that goes on, those people have their eyes opened by Satan for the purpose of deceiving them and sending them to hell. Hmm. But let's continue here. You say, what is the next uh, eye opening? for the body of Christ? What's going to be the next uh, event that you say, boy, that was really eye-opening? What's the next thing that's going to happen? Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So, that next big opening, where your eyes are opened, um, it's coming in the future. I don't know how far off it is. It could be, you know, soon. It could be this year. It could be a couple years. I don't know. No idea. Just keep working for the Lord until He takes us out of here. But, um, let me ask you a question. Are some things going to be changed when that event happens? Yes. <laughs> uh, quite a few things are going to change up here in our brains when our eyes are opened. When you look up there in the sky and you see a door open and you hear that voice. Ryan, come up hither. And we leave. And all of a sudden, we read back there earlier about the blind man, and they said, who is this Jesus? Where is he? And he says, I don't know. I don't know what he looks like. I, I, I've never met him. See, his eyes were open, but he had not seen his Savior yet, just like us today. But there's going to be coming a time, very interesting too, because what happens? 
the blind man is kicked out of the synagogue. They say, get out of here. We don't want you in here. And after he's kicked out, what happens? Jesus Christ reveals himself to him. Almost like a prophecy for the future about Bible-believing Christians having to leave Babel buildings, churches, you know, having to leave Babel buildings, and after that happens, Jesus Christ reveals himself. No tie-ins or anything there. You know, the fact that Laodicea ends there in Revelation chapter 3. Well, we're right there. We might as well just look at it. Revelation chapter 3. It says, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus is on the outside. Hmm. Some prophetic significance there. Interesting. But when that happens, our fight, faith will become sight. We're no longer going to be like, well, you know, I, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I trust in him and whatever else, but what's he look like? I don't know. Just like that, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, changed. Boom. Wow. And we'll see him. Caught up to see Jesus Christ. Well, that's going to change then. Interesting there. John sees a door in heaven. John chapter 10, verse 9 says, I am the door by me if a man, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is also the truth. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And it's interesting because, like I said, we will be changed when we see Jesus face to face. And the scripture for that is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 12. Charity never fail, faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be, there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that's Jesus Christ there, that, that you say, well, that's an uh, impersonal pronoun or whatever. You know, yeah, just like when the angel came and talked to Mary, he said, that holy thing which shall be born of thee. Okay, so it's not a problem. It's just the way God worded it in his word here. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, Bible believers are some of the most childish people out there. Mm -hmm. You know, we get sidetracked so easily. Did you ever see a little child, you know, and they're, and they're paying attention to something, doing something, you know, and they hear a sound, they go, Uh, you know, <laughs> we do that. Studying your Bible and all of a sudden it's like, I think I'm going to watch a video on YouTube and, you know, and, and you end up spending a couple hours. Oh, nuts, I forgot I was supposed to do this or that. You know, we get distracted. We're childish. A lot of times with our doctrinal stands too, we're somewhat childish. But uh, verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, face to face with Christ my Savior, you know. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. You will have the mind of Christ when we get up there to be with the Lord. Why? Because there's not going to be division in heaven. All right. So when you're transformed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, boom, your eyes are going to be opened to the spiritual realm. Now all of a sudden you're going to go, whoa, okay. And you're looking at each other, we'll be looking at each other going, Wow, you know, what happened to my body? Boy, this is really different. Man, isn't this something? Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, wow. I guess it was a rapture, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a rapture. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus Christ. You know, standing up there. And we're all going to hit the clouds, you know. Aren't going to hit the dirt because it's in the clouds. But uh, interesting. Looking forward to that day. But as I said, Satan and the New Agers try to counterfeit that eyes being open. They try to be like, I know what's going on with the earth. There's going to be major changes coming. And that's incredible. These people, a lot of these new Asians, they understand that there are major cataclysmic events coming, but they don't get saved. In their pride, they're like, don't talk to me about God. Don't talk to me about sin. Don't talk to me about the Bible. You say, is the world going to be coming to an end soon or, or very much seeming like it? Well, yeah, I believe that. Just don't talk to me about God and the Bible. Huh? Insanity. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Here's where we get into the thing of people that are possessed with devils. You'll see it in their eyes many times. Matthew chapter 6. 